Well, we've looked at Israel, kind of the overview of Israel's past. We've looked at Israel's modern history and uh, have seen the conflicts that they have been through. Um, so I, wanted, I want to focus now on an aspect that only the Scriptures can speak of, and that is Israel's future. Uh, the Jewish people have been through a, a wearying year, the Jewish community has. Um, with October 7th, the the, the attack itself was horrific, but in many ways, the attack uh, on the Jewish community in the diaspora, in, in the United States, on college campuses and, and um, uh, in institutions has been particularly devastating. One commentator, uh, Andrew Murray, not a Jewish man himself, but uh, he's, a, he's a, an Englishman, he, he said, you know, when October 7th took place, it was like uh, a flare went up, and when it detonated, the Jewish people could look around and see who was standing with them and who were standing uh, against them. Uh, and, and he said, it's become very clear. And that certainly has been the case. Uh, the Jewish community often feels very isolated and very alone, particularly uh, when it comes to uh, anti-Semitism and the perception of Israel as an aggressor in the world. But really, it's not only been the past year that's been wearying, it's been the past four, mil four millennia, the past 4,000 years, not only because of the persecution they face, but also because of the results of their own national sin. We have all probably uh, have, have, can ex say that we've experienced, uh, to some extent, some of the results of our own personal sin. Well, they have experienced it at a national level. Israel's history has been consistently cyclical. and We, we talked about this a little in the last session that it started with obedience, and then blessing, and then sin, and then chastening by God, repentance, and then repeat. And right now, we're kind of in this chastening part of, of that cycle for the nation of Israel. That will tire you out after 4,000 years, and it, and it has. In Ezekiel chapter 37, the nation of Israel is pictured as a valley of, full of dry bones, dried and bleached by the sun. And with their endless cycle of sin, with that, that constant uh, harassment by the nations, they say to themselves, our, hope, our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. I have talked to many, many Jewish people in the last year, and this has been uh, essentially what they've said. They said, we, we just feel cut off. Like, where is, where is all of this going? We're constantly persecuted. If we're not in our land, the world's mad at us. If we are in our land, they're mad at us. If we defend ourselves, the world's mad at us. What can we do that's right? We're, 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 our hope is cut off. And many of them feel alone and abandoned uh, even by God. But what is the truth? What does God say about Israel's future? Let me begin by just reminding us of the present status of Israel. That Israel is chosen by God, blessed by God with numerous covenantal promises, and yet presently a people in rebellion against God as a whole, as a, as a nation. Israel's rejection of the Messiah that God promised to them resulted in this chastening we've been talking about. And uh, it also meant that, that persecution was going to happen. I, I, I always kind of picture it as not that necessarily God is saying, okay, Gentiles, go, go curse this people. It's actually in the hearts of the Gentiles to do that. As God takes his hands off and he says, okay, you want your way, Israel. Go into the nations. Go be like the nations. I, I'm scattering you, and you see how they're going to treat you. And it, it hasn't been good. Indeed, as we saw in the last session, this has been the history of the Jewish people for the last 2,000 years. Uh, the temple being destroyed, the Jewish people scattered, and being persecuted. We're currently, currently living in what we often call the church age, this, this time in which God is, is working not just with the Jewish people, he's drawing Jewish people and Gentiles to himself in, and, and making this new body called the church uh, where we are one in terms of salvation at the foot of the cross. Um, the scriptures tell us that there's coming a day when God is going to pour out his wrath on the world. But before he does that, he will remove those people for whom the Messiah already took the wrath of God. That's the church. We often call this the, the rapture or the plucking up. We find this, by the way, in 1 Thessalonians 4, 16 through 18. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, 
and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up. You say, people often say, the word rapture is not found in the Bible. Well, it is if you speak Latin, because that the rapture is from the word rapturo. In the Greek, the, this word is harpazo. It means to pluck, to pluck up. It's like plucking of a harp. And so we will be caught up, we'll be plucked up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. So the return of Christ coming for his church, where we, we meet him in the clouds, that is to be an encouragement to believers. It's a comfort to us. But I'll tell you, it, it will not be a comfort to the Jewish people who are not believers. Evangelical Christians have been the chief defenders of the Jewish people for many years. And without us here, who's going to stand for them? I was reminded of this uh, a couple of months ago. I was with my daughter at a synagogue. They were having a lecture. And after the lecture, they opened it up for a question and an answer time. And so my daughter and I, we went up to the, to the microphone and um, I just said, I'm, I'm not from the synagogue. You know, I'm an evangelical Christian. I, I love the Jewish people and support you. That's why I'm here. Um, and then I asked, I asked my question. Well, after uh, that lecture time was over, Q&A was over, um, they dismissed us, and a line formed to speak to the speaker, but then another line formed to speak to my daughter and myself. And I thought, what's going on here? And they wanted to, many of the Jewish people wanted to say how grateful they were that there were Christians who love them and who stand with them. And this one young woman in particular, she came up to me, and she, uh, she had tears in her eyes, and she said, can I talk to you? I said, well, sure. She said, I am so grateful for your support. She said, I shudder to think of a world where there aren't Christians who stand with our people. And when I heard that, I thought, that's exactly what's coming. There will be a day when we aren't here. The church is taken out and there will be um, persecution of the Jewish people as has, has never been. So I want us to look at what will happen after the rapture, um, and then kind of setting the stage for what is the future of Israel? What's going to happen to the Jewish people? And I'll warn you, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Uh, There will be someone, the Bible tells us, who arises and promises peace and security to the Jewish people. He has various titles throughout the Scriptures, uh, the man of lawlessness, the beast. Uh, We often call him the Antichrist. The prophet Daniel calls him the prince who is to come. And Daniel gives us a glimpse at how this man is going to behave toward Israel in Daniel chapter 9. You're welcome to turn there. I also, in this slide, have the the, uh, text on the screen. Let me preface this by saying this is a a, a rich passage. There is so much here. Uh, We could spend a couple of days looking at this. But I'm going to try to read through it, explaining as we go, and then draw a few points for our purposes out of it. Daniel is told uh, by an angel of of the Lord, 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. That word weeks, uh, it's not, in in the Hebrew, it's not the, the the term weeks, it's the term seven. Seventy sevens are determined, or heptads. In, in English, we don't really have a, a good English word for a, a set of sevens. Weeks is what's often translated. The 77s or 70 weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city. Let's stop there so we have some context. Who are Daniel's people? The Jewish people, right? He's in exile. And for your holy city, what is his holy city? Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Now, these are the purposes. To finish the transgression to make an end of sins, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. Some of yours may say the most holy place. Some of yours, your translations may say the holiest of holies. Uh, it's, it's, it's either the place or the person. Verse 25, Know therefore and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem, this is under the Babylonian captivity, Until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven sevens, or seven weeks, and sixty-two weeks. The street shall be built again, 
and the wall even in troublesome times. So the time frame is there's going to be a decree, Daniel, that's given to your people to begin rebuilding the city of Jerusalem. And that happens. Uh, when you look at, we can read the book of Nehemiah, we can read about that issuing of the decree. Uh, and there's this time frame is from that decree to the coming of the Messiah. Seven sevens and 62 sevens. 70, or, excuse me, 69 sevens. Verse 26. And after the 62 sevens, or weeks, Messiah shall be cut off, but not for himself. And the people of the prince who is to come shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Notice it does not say the prince who is to come is going to destroy this. It says the people of the prince who's going to come will destroy the city, Jerusalem, and the sanctuary, the temple. The end of it shall be with a flood until the end of the war desolations are determined. Did that happen? Was the Messiah cut off? Yes, he was, right? He was killed. The Messiah, Jesus, is, is cut off. He's killed. And then there is a people of the prince who is to come who come in and they destroy the city and the sanctuary. Who were, the, who were those people? 70 AD, they were the Romans. Romans. The people of the prince who is to come. Verse 27. Then he, speaking of this prince who is to come, shall confirm a covenant with many for one seven. I believe that's a seven-year period each of these weeks. But in the middle of, that, of the week, he shall bring an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wings of abomination shall be one who makes desolate, even until the consummation, the end, which is determined, is poured out on the desolate. So again, there's a lot here. Uh, and it, it's, it's, there's commentators who debate these things. But for our purposes, I want to draw your attention to just a few things. First of all, after a period of 62 sevens, 62 weeks, uh, the Messiah will be cut off. He'll be killed. We know, as we said, that that did happen. The following that, the next significant event Daniel is told about is that a people referred to as the people of the prince who is to come will come to Jerusalem. They will destroy the city and the sanctuary, the temple. That happens in 70 AD. Thirdly, then a man, that prince who is to come, will make a covenant with many for one week. Who will he make this covenant with? We opened with, who, who's, who is this all about? Daniel's people, the Jewish people. This covenant will be made with them. Evidently, this will be a covenant that protects the Jewish people in some way, allowing them to sacrifice and make offerings in a temple in Jerusalem. Problem, is there a temple in Jerusalem right now? No. There will be, evidently, a rebuilt one. Ezekiel also speaks of this in Ezekiel 40 through 44 of a rebuilt temple in the millennial kingdom. So there, evidently, there was going to be another temple built prior to that during what we call the tribulation period. And then finally, halfway through that covenant, which would be about three and a half years in, that prince who is to come will break his covenant, bringing, quote, an end to sacrifice and offering and will bring desolation and desecration. And so it seems that he will actually set himself up as God in the rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Uh, we read about this uh, in Matthew 24 in particular. So that is the background for our topic of Israel's future. These are some of the events we're told will, will happen, I believe, following the rapture. Now, that brings us to what's called the time of Jacob's trouble. And that's not something, some theological uh, term that pastors or theologians have come up with. This is a direct quote from Jeremiah 30, verse 7, where uh, Jeremiah says that there's coming a time and it will be the time of Jacob's trouble, meaning the time of Israel, the time of the Jewish people's trouble. So when the Antichrist breaks that covenant, it will literally be hell on earth for the Jewish people and for the world. The prophet Jeremiah refers to this, as I said, as the time of Jacob's trouble, as a, an unparalleled time of anti-Semitic persecution at the hands of the Antichrist, who, as, as we will see in Scripture, is motivated by Satan himself. Daniel is told that this period shall be for a time, times, and half a time. Three, one, or the two, one, and a half. Three and a half is how I interpret that. In other words, this persecution will last for about three and a half years, and it will be aimed at shattering the Jewish people. The Lord Jesus warns Israel about the same time in Matthew 24. He says, Therefore, when you see the abomination of desolation spoken of by Daniel the prophet, we just read about that. When you see that, 
standing in the holy place. The holy place in the Bible is always what place? The temple. Whoever reads, let him understand. Then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let him who is on the housetop not go down to take anything out of his house. And let him who is in the field not go back to get his clothes. He's saying, get out of Dodge now. This is, this is bad. Verse 19, But woe to those who are pregnant and, those, uh, and to those who are nursing babies in those days. And pray that your flight may not be in winter or on the Sabbath. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved, but for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. And we can get so consumed with this horrific period um, that we miss its purpose. The Antichrist, though he's motivated by Satan, he will seem to be at the helm of this time of Jacob's trouble seeking to destroy the Jewish people. But really, God is going to be using this as the ultimate time of chastening of His people. Now this is really where you see the sovereignty of God and and Satan's plans uh, working at the same time. Remember, this is not two equals, God and Satan. God is in control. Satan is a created being. And yet he has a plan to try to annihilate this people to whom God has made these covenants. And yet God is not panicked. He's using all of this for his purposes. And that's primarily to chasten the Jewish people. Many Jewish people, unfortunately, will be killed during this time. But God will never allow his chosen people to be annihilated. Rather, he will use this time of Jacob's trouble to draw Israel to himself. We read about this in Zechariah chapter 13, verses 8 and 9. The Lord says to Zechariah, And it shall come to pass in all the land, says the Lord, that two-thirds in it shall be cut off and die, but one-third shall be left in it. I will bring the one-third through the fire and refine them as silver is refined and test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and each one will say, the Lord is my God. So Zechariah, God tells Zechariah, there's coming a time during this time of Jacob's trouble when of the Jewish people living in the land of Israel at the time, two-thirds of them will be killed at the hands of Antichrist. But God is going to preserve one-third of them. Remember, we said all throughout the history of Israel, there's always a remnant, isn't there? And this remnant that God brings through, He says He's going to refine them. And it's going to be like gold or silver is refined. How is gold and silver refined? They're put through what? Heat. Heat, fire. This is not going to be an easy time, but they will come through. And this people will be saved. When Paul writes about this in Romans 11. He says, and so all Israel will be saved. All of the Jewish people living at that time will personally come to faith in the Lord Jesus. And so the purpose here is chastening. It's refinement that leads to our next major point, and that is the regeneration of Israel. So we're going to look here, at, when we talk about Israel's future, at three things. The regeneration of Israel, that means their salvation. The regathering of Israel, to their land in belief, and their restoration of Israel. Their restoration is God's people and and the the plans that he has for them. So let's look at first at the regeneration of Israel. Now you remember the Lord's words to Israel following the pronouncement of of woes on the nation. He said in Matthew 23, 37-39, he says, O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the one who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but what? You were not willing. See, your house is left to you desolate. For I say to you, you shall see me no more. What does it say? Till you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. A couple of things here. Notice, first of all, this is a pronouncement right after Jesus has gone through all these woes in Matthew 23 on the Pharisees. Woe to the scribes and Pharisees for all of they are doing to the nation of Israel. These, these blind guides trying to lead uh, blind people. And then this final woe on the whole city, on the whole people of Israel is that you rejected me as the Messiah. You're not going to see me anymore. But it doesn't, it, there's not a period there, is there? It says, you shall see me no more Till you say, blessed is he 
who comes in the name of the Lord. When will the Messiah return to this earth? Well, it will be when the Jewish people call on him to save them. This is distinct from the rapture. The second coming and the rapture are two different things. The prophet Zechariah records what God says of this event um, in Zechariah 12.10. He says, And I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. If you want to know, when it says that the Jewish people are going to grieve what are they going to be saying? You can read Isaiah chapter 53. We're going to look at this tomorrow in depth, Isaiah 53. It is this lament of, oh, we, are, we were so wrong. We thought the Messiah was going to be this, and this is what the Messiah was. We didn't regard Jesus when he came, but we now see who he really is. And so this lament is going to happen. So this remnant of the Jewish people who survived that time of Jacob's trouble their backs up against the wall, the, the Antichrist at their heels, realize finally that the cause of their persecution has been ultimately their national rejection of Jesus as the Messiah. They will mourn as they realize that the one they have sought for all these centuries is in reality the same one they gave up to be crucified, and they will mourn for it. We'll look at this tomorrow, but in Isaiah 53, you, you know this probably very well, the Jewish nation says, Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. That's substitutionary atonement, isn't it? His perfectness, our imperfectness. And there's a swap. And the nation of Israel will say this. So to a person, the remnant of the nation of Israel at this time will be saved from their sin and they will enter into the new covenant that God promised with them. We find this new covenant in Jeremiah 31. We looked at Jeremiah 31, 37 uh, earlier. But let me just read to you Jeremiah 31, 31 through 37 as it relates to the new covenant. Remember, this is written to Israel and Judah as they are in captivity. And often throughout the prophets when God... Uh, gives judgment to the Jewish people, he supplements it with this promise of their future. And that's what we find here. The Lord says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day that I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant which they broke, though I was a husband to them, says the Lord. So we know this is speaking of the Mosaic covenant, the covenant that they broke. Remember, you can't break the Abrahamic covenant. That's God made all those promises. But in the Mosaic covenant, you have God saying, I will do this if you will obey. Israel says, yep, we'll do that. And they end up breaking it. Verse 33, But this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. No more shall every man teach his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and their sin I will remember no more. God's saying there's not going to be a need for teachers and preachers of the Jewish people and to the Jewish people because this covenant is going to be made with them. They're going to individually come to saving faith in Jesus the Messiah and they're going to have the Word of God written on their hearts. The Spirit of God will teach them. They don't need a teacher at this point. God goes on to describe the eternality of His promises. Thus says the Lord who gives the sun for a light by day, the ordinances of the moon and the stars for a light by night, who disturbs the sea and its waves roar, the Lord of hosts is His name. If those ordinances, meaning the sun, the moon, the stars, the waves, if those ordinances depart from before me, says the Lord, then the seed of Israel shall also cease from being a nation before me forever. Thus says the Lord, if heaven above can be measured and the foundations of the earth searched out beneath, I will also cast off all the seed of Israel for all that they have done. So that's the covenant that's coming, this new covenant. 
We benefit as believers from the shed blood of Jesus the Messiah. We, we look forward to that new covenant. Whenever we take the Lord's Supper, we, we remember the blood that was shed. But that new covenant will ultimately be entered into by Israel and Judah following this time of Jacob's trouble. But even though their sins are forgiven, the Antichrist and his armies will still be persecuting them. In fact, this is what the campaign of Armageddon, we often talk about Armageddon, that's what this is all about, is the nations of the world under the, under the direction of the Antichrist, they're coming against the Jewish people. Israel's response to this is to call on their Messiah. What are they going to say? Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is Jesus said. You're not going to see me until you say that. And this, the nation will call on him. And he returns. And when he does, he saves Israel from their enemies. In fact, we call it the Battle of Armageddon. It's actually a series of campaigns that will happen. But it's not much of a fight. Because as soon as the Lord returns, he puts out that, that flame. And it's over. And we read about this in Matthew 24. Jesus speaking here, he says, Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The nations of the world who have come against Israel, when Jesus is coming in the clouds, it's not going to be an isolated event. Everybody will see his return, and they will mourn. And they're mourning, why? Because they know that the time is up. This is, this is over. Everybody out of the pool, as one pastor says. It, it's over. In fact, Zechariah speaks of this as well. Zechariah um, chapter 14, uh, verses 3 and 4, G God says to Zechariah, Then the Lord will go forth and fight against those nations as He fights in the day of battle. And in that day His feet will stand on the Mount of Olives, which faces Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall be split in two from east to west, making a very large valley. Half of the mountain shall move toward the north and half of it toward the south. Every time I go to the Mount of Olives, I can't help but think about this. They're standing on the top. There's usually some um, Arab men giving rides on camels and, and selling postcards and things like that. You get a beautiful view of, of Jerusalem. And you think, there's coming a day when his, the Messiah's feet are going to stand right here. And when they touch, <laughs> that mountain splits. And he is going to enter into very swift judgment with the nations. So that is the regeneration of Israel. That is when the, the nation of Israel as a whole, the Jewish people in that day, they all, to a person, come to personal faith in Jesus. They are all saved. But now let's look at the regathering of Israel. When we see the state of Israel today, we recognize that, I, believe, I do, as, as a, an act of God. That this people that have been scattered for some 1,900 years are now brought back into the land. It's going to result, ultimately, in this time of Jacob's trouble, a, a very horrific time of judgment. The Jewish people have experienced multiple deportations and one dispersion to the nations of the world. And that's why wherever you go today, you can find ancient Jewish communities dating back many centuries due to God's dispersion of their people from the land. Uh, the final regathering of Israel, though, is for blessing. That first regathering is in anticipation of this time of chastening during the time of Jacob's trouble. But God is going to regather all of the Jewish people who haven't moved back to the land following their regeneration. This final or second regathering for Israel uh, is spoken of in the book of Zechariah, again, chapter 8. There, in verse 7 and 8, the Lord says, Thus says the Lord of hosts, Behold, I will save my people from the land of the east and from the land of the west. I will bring them back, and they shall dwell in the midst of Jerusalem. They shall be my people, and I will be their God in truth and righteousness. So here you have the people back in the land, but they're there permanently. They're there righteously. They're a saved people. Ezekiel speaks of this as well. Ezekiel chapter 36, verse, beginning in verse 22. God says to Ezekiel, Therefore say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, but for my holy name's sake, which you have profaned among the nations wherever you went. And I will sanctify my great name, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And what's going to happen? The nations shall know that I am the Lord, says the Lord God, when I am hallowed in, your eyes before, in, in you before their eyes. 
For I will take you from among the nations, gather you out of all countries, and bring you into your own land. Remember, one of the things that we see all throughout God's dealings with Israel is that He is the star of the show, right? Israel is not the star. Israel often is kind of the foil to God's righteous faithfulness to them. And they are the ones that are unfaithful. And, and he says, wherever you've gone, you've profaned my name. You've, you've made my name nothing wherever you've gone because of your rebellion. But he says, the day is coming when I'm going to regather you, and I'm going to do it not because I, you necessarily deserve it. I'm going to do it so that my name is glorified among all the people that you profaned it with. And so they're going, they will be replanted in their land. That is the regathering. But then finally, we see the restoration of Israel. What do I mean by Restoration. Well, the Jewish people, of course, are known as God's chosen people. Their charter was to be, as God says in Deuteronomy 7, uh, to be a holy people to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for Himself, that special treasure above all the peoples on the face of the earth. Now, as we've talked about several times, God told Israel that obedience to the covenant would make them the head and not the tail of the nations. The nations would look at Israel and they would see that is a nation blessed by God. There is a nation that, that, that God is working through. They are obedient to God. He blesses them and His name is being magnified throughout the world to the Gentiles. But that, of course, is not what happened. They didn't obey the covenant. But in a marvelous display of God's glory, God promises not only to rescue Israel from their enemies, not only to save them, regenerate them because of their sins, but also he's going to restore Israel to the place of prominence that they were always supposed to occupy as the chosen people of God. They will have the kingdom that they've longed for. They will be a righteous people. They will be planted back in their own land. So let's look at this. First of all, Israel will finally be at peace in their own land. That's part of this restoration. In Zechariah chapter 14, we read this. All the land shall be turned into a plain from Geba to Ramon south of Jerusalem. Now you know something about Jerusalem. Anytime uh, you read about Jerusalem in the Bible and someone's traveling there, they're said to be going where? Up to Jerusalem. And if you've been to Israel, you know Jerusalem is one of the highest points of elevation. And so if you want to get there, you're probably coming up from some other place. And so at this time, though, God says there's going to be, it's going to be made a plain. It's going to be a flat place. Jerusalem shall be raised up and inhabited in her place from Benjamin's gate to the place of the first gate and the corner gate and from the tower of Hananel to the king's wine presses. The people shall dwell in it and no longer shall there be utter destruction. But what? Jerusalem shall be safely inhabited. I've walked the streets of Jerusalem at midnight. I feel pretty safe. You know why I feel pretty safe? because I see these young guys with AK-47s on their sides, and I'm glad for that. But there's coming a day when there's not going to need to be AK-47s in Jerusalem. This is going to be a peace that comes because God has vanquished all of Israel's enemies, and that's coming. Secondly, Israel will be honored by the nations. Is Israel honored by the nations today? Hardly. Uh, The United Nations Security Council, they are tasked with Security, trying to keep the world kind of a peaceful place. They're doing a really horrible job at it. But you know, they, they, every time they meet, the bulk of their time together, do you know what they spend the time doing? Issuing condemnations of one country, the Jewish country. They don't pass resolutions about North Korea. They don't pass resolutions about Iran or the Palestinian territories or Syria where they've genocided their own people or, or any of these other places, Israel. Part of it's probably because all of the people on the Security Council are the Arab neighbors that hate Israel. But that is how uh, the nations think of the Jewish people. But the com- when God restores them, they will be honored by the nations. We see this. It's one of my favorite verses and their passages in Zechariah. Zechariah 8, thus says the Lord of hosts, peoples, remember when you hear peoples, that means what kind of people are they usually? Gentiles. Gentiles. Peoples shall yet come, inhabitants of many cities. 
the inhabitants of one city shall go to another, saying, Let us continue to go and pray before the Lord and seek the Lord of hosts. I myself will go also. Yes, many peoples and strong nations shall come to seek the Lord of hosts in Jerusalem and to pray before the Lord. Again, there's going to be a rebuilt temple in Jerusalem. Uh, we read that in Ezekiel. We read of that in the book of Revelation. And so the nations of the world, Gentiles, we're going to be going there to worship God. But notice this. Look at what the Gentiles say. Thus says the Lord of hosts, In those days, ten men from every language of the nations shall grasp the sleeve of a Jewish man, saying, Let us go with you, for we have heard that God is with you. This is a complete reversal of all of Jewish history. That word corners, or that word, excuse me, um, sleeve, where it says a sleeve of a Jewish man, it's actually translated in the Hebrew, it's corners. And it refers to the corners of their prayer shawl that God told them to wear. They have the corners would always be showing on their prayer shawl. And he says that there's coming a day when 10 men from every nation or from the nations is going to come and they're going to grab the, the Jewish man, but they're not going to curse him. They're going to bless him. They're going to say, we're going to go with you because you are blessed of the Lord. Throughout Jewish history, many people have grabbed the sleeve of the Jewish people, but it's usually been to persecute them. If you go to Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Jerusalem, or down to Farmington Hills to see the Holocaust Museum there, what you see is the, the unparalleled un, uh, terror that was, has been released on the Jewish people. It was released on the peop Jewish people during the Holocaust which represents much of what happened throughout their history. But in this day, the, the nations will bless Israel, not curse them. We also see that in this restoration, Israel will lead the worship, will lead the world in the worship of God. Again, in Zechariah, you can tell it's one of my favorite books. Zechariah 14, the Lord says, And it shall come to pass that everyone who is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem shall go up from year to year to worship the King, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It's the, in, in Hebrew, Sukkot. And it shall be that whichever of the families of the earth do not come up to Jerusalem to worship, the King, the Lord of hosts, on them there will be no rain. So God says even in this time, in the kingdom, the millennial kingdom, uh, there will be nations, there will be, we will be spread out and yet at least once a year, the nations are going to be required to come to Jerusalem to worship at the Feast of Sukkot, of Tabernacles, which is significant because the Feast of Tabernacles uh, was always a picture throughout Israel's history of how God was going to dwell with them. And so now you have God literally dwelling with man in the kingdom, and he says, you're going to come up to commemorate that. And if there's rebel nations who don't want to do that, no rain for you. And so that's going to happen. He goes on and says, If the family of Egypt will not come up and enter in, they shall have no rain. They shall receive the plague with which the Lord strikes the nations who do not come up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This shall be the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all the nations that do not come up to the Feast of Tabernacles. You think Egypt wants to be the nation that, doesn't, that, that experienced the plagues of God? They say, been there, done that. I don't want to do that anymore. In that day, holiness to the Lord shall be engraved on the bells of the horses, the pots in the Lord's houses. Uh, excuse me, did that change? No, I'm sorry. Um, the pots in the Lord's house shall be like the bowls before the altar in the temple. Yes, every pot in Jerusalem and Judah shall be holiness to the Lord of hosts. Everyone who sacrifices shall come and take them and cook in them. And that day there shall no longer be a Canaanite in the house of the Lord of, the, of hosts. So what we see here is God is saying, even from the pots that the Jewish people use to cook in, they're going to be a holy people. And this Jerusalem is going to be the place where the world will worship and, and Israel will lead them in the worship of God. Finally, Israel's righteous king will reign during this time. In Zechariah 14, again, we read, And in that day it shall be that living waters shall flow from Jerusalem, half of them toward the eastern sea and half of them toward the western sea, in both summer and winter it shall occur. And the Lord shall be king over all the earth. And that day it shall be the Lord is one, or in Hebrew, 
Adonai Echad. The Lord is one and His name one. Because from, from Jerusalem, Jesus, the, the, the promised seed of David, that promised seed of the woman, the King of Israel, is going to sit on His throne and He will rule the world in truth and in righteousness. And it's going to be a global peace that will happen. I want us to talk as we, as we close here about the character of God in light of all this. One of the tragic temptations that believers sometimes fall into when studying Israel and their future is to think that it's all about Israel. That, that, that all of this is all about how great the nation is. But as I've said, Israel isn't the star of this show. It is the keeper of Israel, the one who keeps Israel, who is the star. We've just reviewed the last seven or so years of Israel's history, that 70th week of Daniel. And we've briefly touched on what the millennial kingdom will be like, centered in Jerusalem with Jesus righteously reigning and ruling. What should strike us is not only the unfaithfulness of Israel, but the outrageous faithfulness of God. Israel has been and, and will be right up to the end this idolatrous, rebellious people. Given the revelation of God the, the, through the Scriptures, given the, the covenants, the law, that temple service, the Messiah Himself, this is a nation that continually has all of this, this blessing and yet has rejected God's authority. And yet God doesn't cast them off. He does not allow them to be annihilated, although that's been temp- attempted numerous times. It's being attempted now. He doesn't give their blessings and promises to another people. He doesn't say, oh, the church, you're now Israel. He is faithful. Why is he faithful? Well, we've looked at this, but I want to hammer it home. Romans eleven twenty eight and 29. Concerning the gospel, the Jewish, people is our, the Jewish people are enemies for your sake, but concerning the election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Why? For the gifts and the calling of God are irrevocable. Or as Paul writes to Timothy, if we are faithless, He remains faithful. Why? Because he cannot deny himself. The Lord God of Israel is the star of the story of history. Star of Israel's history. He's the star of world history. He is the one that deserves our worship and our awe. You know, as believers, we are constantly, we we must constantly fight to have a biblical worldview. Because our culture is going to bring up issues and they're going to come to conclusions on those issues that are very much at odds with what God says. You probably experience that only every day, right? Just within maybe your own families and communities or on social media. We, we see what the world thinks about so many things. And it's sadly very easy for believers and, and for the church as a whole to adopt unbiblical views. Usually not consciously, but they, they start to, we imbibe them. And so we must never think that we're above such seductive temptations. In the past several years, we've seen entire denominations and fellowships of churches fall. Churches that once stood for the gospel of Jesus Christ and for the truthfulness of Scripture. And it's interesting, one of the the first things to fall when they reject the authority of God's Word alone, the Bible alone, is their view on Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, if you go to a lot of major cities, I often will I go to Ann Arbor. And at, in Ann Arbor, uh, you drive downtown and you see all these big historic churches. And what do you see flying from the sides of those churches? Gay pride flags. You see uh, most of those churches that have given up like that on, on the authority of God's word. They have given up the ship when it comes to marriage and sexuality. You know what they also usually are known for? Hating Israel. Hating Israel. They lead in uh, condemning the Jewish people. The Presbyterian Church USA, United Methodist Church, many of these denominations have come out and made statements saying the Jewish people have no right to the land in Israel. We need to be careful of that. We have to push back against such temptations. So I'm not speaking of a culture war. I'm not saying we need to, we need to you know, gang up on those who don't agree with us. But we do need to push back against bad ideas that take place, that take root in our own churches. Specifically, in our case, concerning the Jewish people. And doing so not with crafty arguments, but with a clear and plain teaching of the Word of God. Because ultimately, do you know what wins people's hearts? It's not your ability to best them in, a, in an argument. It's saying, well... 
here's what God's Word says. You need to argue with this. And I trust that throughout today, you have seen that God's Word speaks very clearly uh, about Israel. That they are His chosen people. They always will be. He doesn't endorse their sin. In fact, He's chastening them for it. But He loves them. And it's our responsibility as believers to love them as well. And to do that by sharing the good news and supporting them wherever we can.